try for it. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon to you all and welcome to the Trust Benevolence Panel. I'm Vasana Bandara. I'm an associate professor here at the School of Information Systems and I work very closely with Michael. I think this is my 22nd year of working with him. So that's a long history together, year 2022 and 22 years of working with Michael. Um, trust is a very important phenomena. It's become much more important nowadays than even before. We've got digital disruption, we've got the pandemic, and we have a huge dependency on the decisions that corporate executives make. It in impacts individuals, entire communities, right? So obviously trust is a very important phenomena and lots of people have been talking about trust for a long time. But questions such as, as an individual, I keep on asking myself, when I'm thinking about buying something or providing um, my details, is my information going to be safe? Am I going to be serviced in a fair and equitable manner and a continuous manner? I need to trust the people that I'm going to be investing in as a consumer. And today we are going to have a panel that focuses on unpacking this trust notion. QUT Center for Future Enterprise has an entire program dedicated to this, which is led by Michael Roseman. And we know that despite the fact that it's been spoken about a lot, there's very little information out there that guides us about how to design, how to manage, how to measure trust. One thing that we do know is that the concept of benevolence, corporate benevolence, being kind, being understanding, uh, putting the best thing that's for your customer ahead is a key facet of building trust. And that's what this panel is about to unpack for you. And we are also very privileged to have four distinguished members from our local community, experts who have this concept of doing the right thing, doing good to your customers in the forefront of their day-to-day -day businesses. And with that, I'd like to very quickly introduce you to our panelists. We've got Daniel Duell, who's the founder and CEO of People with Purpose. We've got Cassandra Hockwalner, who is the head of customer relations at the BOQ Group. And we've got Michelle Hughes, who's the chief marketing officer uh, at McCarthy Dury Lawyers. And we've got Terry Weber, who's the regional manager looking after the Cisco operations in Queensland, Northern Territory and Papua New Guinea. So before we start, can I ask you to please welcome our panelists <laughs> to the session. So thank you very much. And um, I know this is a topic that's very close to you. And personally, as a person who's researching about benevolence, I find this to be a very uh, mysterious and important concept, especially the notion of benevolence. How can you be kind and at the same time consider profit generation? And Danielle, I pose the first question to you. I know, I know that you have a passion and that you're a strong believer that doing good and earning profit is something that can go hand in hand, right? And I also know that you have a passion towards building capabilities uh, for organizations to, to, to make these uh, two things come together. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, how do you see benevolence being a part of the corporate strategy? Thanks, Wasana. Uh, well, I see um, benevolence as a principle that would inform the strategy. And, and I guess in terms of hierarchy, uh, I, I personally believe in terms of strategy that the purpose is the most superordinate goal. Why does the organization exist? What impact is it trying to make? Now, of course, an organisation that adopts benevolence as a principle would choose a uh, would choose a purpose that is um, considering you know is well intended that is kind is stakeholder um, is stakeholder centred. So I think if purpose is the why, um, and then the vision of putting that purpose into practice is the what what the future looks like. Um, that benevolence would sit somewhere in the how, somewhere in the strategy. So um, it might show up in, in the strategy, it might show up in the culture, in the values and, and the beliefs. And I, um, we heard in this morning's session um, with Roberto um, a bit of, you know, some of these sort of ideas come out. And I think what we've seen in, in recent decades is a bit of a shift from uh, social and environmental um, indifference 
um, or ignorance, sort of move to indifference, move to social and environmental awareness, mm -hmm. um, to social um, and environmental uh, responsibility, uh, to, you know, now social and environmental impact and benefit. And therefore, you know, having benevolence as a guiding principle definitely informs a strategy around that. In terms of um, uh, how, how that's showing up, we... Um, a report that just came out in the last couple of weeks uh, by uh, Social Enterprise Australia identifies that there's about 12,000 social enterprises in our country now um, uh, contributing um, a few billion dollars to the economy and employing about 200,000 people. Uh, so as, as we heard this morning, you know, measurement is important. Um, today, B Corp... Um, uh, have announced that there's, we're now up to 500 B Corps in Australia, uh, which sounds sounds small, but I think these are all signals uh, of of these things becoming business as usual. Thank you very much for that. I'll ask a question perhaps after we go through a round about the profit generation and benevolence, because you mentioned about B Corps, but I'm also keen on how can benevolence be a key part in other types of businesses. So we'll park that mm -hmm. for a moment. Um, Cassandra, I would like to ask you, with your background with customer loyalty and specifically focusing on hearing the voice of the people, employees and customers, um, how might you seek to use the voice of customers to identify how and where benevolence can be implemented? Excellent. This is a question I can answer. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know. It's a bit like an interview. Um, so, hi, I'm Cass. Uh, I work at BOQ Group. You might know it as Bank of Queensland. And if you are an avid reader of the Australian Financial Review, you might see we've had um, a little bit of an interesting week. So, um, my team looks after customer complaints. So we see the worst experiences that our customers have across all of our brands. Um, and previously to working in banking, I worked in the utilities industry. So we're in a really unique position in that we do see the worst, um, where we fail to deliver a product or service or um, stick to a, a commitment that we've made. And obviously in banking, that has a really big impact on people's lives. Um, so what I always say when I, when I you know, talk to my team or anybody in the organisation, a customer relations team who manages complaints, they have to do just two things but they need to do them really damn well. And the first one is we need to manage the individual customer complaint uh, and we need to get a resolution for that individual customer. Mm. But the second thing that we need to do, arguably even better, is using the insights from those complaints that we're receiving across all of the brands to identify trends and issues in order to use them to drive the business to create a better experience to avoid future customers experiencing the same thing. Thank you very much. Um, I might pass the questions now to Terry. Yes, um, so Terry, I would like to understand in your view, when um, would you want to see benevolence come into play in, in corporations like Cisco? Uh, thanks, Masana, and appreciate the question. I, Really good insight too, by the way, Cass. I, I really like that. I think um, a couple of things. For, for benevolence for us, to me, it's uh, when it matters most, we do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, at that, that point, and as Cass just alluded to, it, it tends to be at an individual uh, engagement or relationship or with, with an individual customer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, for us, like we're, we're 85,000 people, you know, $50 billion company, millions of customers. Everything we do has a policy and a procedure. Mm -hmm. And I think benevolence is really what happens in the margins. What happens that we can empower our people to make decisions to do the right thing that still align with company policy. And that's sometimes a hard thing, but, but 
ultimately it's the right thing. I think the other point, Cass, that you raise as well, it's sometimes challenging to do benevolence at scale. And mm. uh, I won't talk very quickly about that, but I think we saw, I think the pandemic gave some examples of when benevolence did happen at scale. And I will also just say that I've never used the word benevolence so much in my life as I did today. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, we had um, Anne from BCC up here earlier. BCC is a great example of uh, a benevolent act. When, when we were during the pandemic, uh, they um, allowed people to park in the city without, uh, without being fined or you know, park wherever you like, park in loading zones, there's no mm. clear ways. So, so it was quite a benevolent act by our, by our, our council and, and a very good one because it allowed people to return to the city and mm. people who were worried about public transport, they could get in and do their job. And so that was, that was a great thing. I think um, so that was benevolence at scale. I think uh, in some ways, from a government perspective as well, job keeper and job seeker were both benevolence at scale. Mm. Um, but they probably also showed the other side of benevolence, which is people will sometimes take advantage of it. So that's, that's the challenging one, is that when you do it at scale, you know you're going to have to have people who will ability work out how do I take advantage of it. So that's the risk. But, yeah. Thank you for that. Michelle, I'd like to pose a question to you. Um, you are working in a legal firm and legal firms have different perspectives in their customer based per perceptions, I would say. So how do you see benevolence enacting or coming into life in the legal sector? It, it's an interesting thing. And I think that this can be applied to many of the service sector, so whether that's engineering or accounting and so on. Uh, but particularly in the legal sector, it is what you would call a grudge purchase for the most part. And that is generally because, you know, you don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm really excited about writing a will today. Or uh, let's get into mm -hmm. some very expensive litigation. That sounds like fun. So it's usually something which you engage services because you might be backed into a corner because there is some kind of challenge which is facing you at that point in time. And so uh, as an individual, you have to put your trust uh, that scales, you know, if it's a conveyance, that's that's low amount of trust. It's it's um, a purchase, but it's quite a transactional kind of thing. When you're talking about family law and some kind of separation, that's a bit more. Where you're talking about your large business and and the empire you've created and and partnership disputes or or being sued for something, it increases. So you can see where, regardless of where it fits, there's that importance to build trust on the lawyer's part with their client in the marketplace. So how does benevolence come into this? It's a really interesting question. And I think that Cass and Terry have touched on it so significantly. It's the scale side of things where it comes into effect and it's empowering our people when they are in that situation, when they are talking with somebody to make those decisions and, and put in place, put in motion, whatever that benevolent act happens to be. My opinion is that, you know, this really comes from a cultural shift and as a leadership team, we have to walk our talk. We can't expect our people on the front face when they're having those conversations with their clients to think about going that extra step, to, to take the extra effort if we aren't going to set that example and create an emotionally intelligent environment where they are likely to identify those opportunities. Thank you very much. It's interesting that all three of you, perhaps all four of you, touched upon the relationship aspect of it. So do you see benevolence to be, and this is an open question to the panelists, is it more of an individual uh, thing that you do with the customer or can benevolence be standardised, for example? Any I'll, views? I'll jump in early because uh, I don't have a, um, a lot. But so um, I think Danielle touched on it. it, it culture becomes mm. a key piece. And if you can create the right culture with people to do the right thing, then I think you're on the track to everybody doing it. It still happens at an individual layer, but you have more people empowered in your organisation to, to do that. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I read um, Kate Rayworth's book, Donut Economics, recently. Has anyone else read that one? Yeah, so she had um, this sort of corporate spectrum in there that um, started with do nothing, um, uh, do what pays. So we'll be kind because we don't want to lose that customer because they're worth a lot of money to us. Um, do what's fair. And then that comes down to perceptions of fairness. Um, then um, do no harm. 
uh, and then the sort of highest order was be generous. And so I think um, there's, you know, there's, there's both the culture um, piece, the implicit norms, but then there also need to be the explicit norms. What are the guiding policies and principles for organisations that the people then know, okay, that's the policy, but then what are the implicit norms um, that, that give discre discretionary power so to make decisions um, in an agile case-by-case um, -case way? Thank you. I can give you a quick example. Uh, I started working with UE Insurance when they entered the country back in 2008. And as one of our programs, which we were running, so I was an external consultant, uh, we had a unique rewards program where people, when they had any kind of claim, we would send out a gift to them, an act of benevolence. It was an unexpected uh, delight after something which was quite traumatic for them. You know, if your house is flooded or something like that, it can be quite awful. and. Uh, what we did was train all of those call centre staff that whenever they had a conversation to listen out for, you know, oh, it was an accident in the Bunnings car park. Oh, okay, well, let's send like a little a gardening kit or something. Mm -hmm. So it was training people to think from that grassroots level about the uh, what would connect with that individual. And over time, obviously, scale grew. That was where we re-looked at that whole program and, and designed the UE Rewards program. So that is where it went from being that connection with the individual to an organisational uh, st stage. But mm. I really think in order to understand that and get that full appreciation, you've got to start with the one-on-one -on -one and then upscale that to the organisation. Okay, thank you. Cass, do you want to make any comments? Uh, I, I very much agree in terms of it is a cultural piece and having worked in um, the world of customer complaints and advocacy for longer than I'd like to admit, um, <laughs> in the early days I very much saw um, there was this theme and culture of if I'm in a complaints team it's my job to defend the organisation and it, you know, it's the customer who's done the wrong thing. And things have really started to evolve over time where um, the, and it, it, take, it does take time. It's not an overnight thing where you can say, no, your job's not to defend, your job is to get an outcome and act in a reasonable way and do the right thing um, so yeah really it it is a, a cultural piece and it, I think that it really needs to be led from the top down it, people need in the front line need the support of not only the the process but to see senior leaders um, showing benevolence and acting with benevolence as well thank you now we talked about different perspectives of benevolence and how it's operationalized and so forth. I'm really keen to understand your view about the impacts of benevolence and how do you know it's impacted? Profit orientation or any other forms? Any comments, please? Michelle? Look, it really depends on the organization and, and where you are. But to me, the impact of benevolence, like authentic benevolence, is the intangible bond that that forms. It's the trust, it's the loyalty, and from a customer perspective in the service sector, you know, it's that, well, I'm gonna go to them because I know that they're going to do the right thing by me. And if you think about it like holding hands in a chain, every one of those benevolent acts tightens the grip. Mm. And, and, you know, regardless of how strong those forces are that pull you apart, that is what's going to tie you together long term. So I would suggest, you know, in, in the services space, it's about the repeat business, the mm -hmm. whole total customer life value, the referral value uh, and what that brings to you. So I would measure it more in that way, which does come back to profitability, but there's a bit more to it than that. But how would you attach the act of benevolence to those measures? Because there's a certain amount of disconnect, right? Ah. Well, this is the, always the challenge, isn't it? Yes. It's the, the measurement of those things. And it, this comes back again to your culture and building it into your organisational culture and goals and what is set in place. And working on this at the moment, it, it is a challenge. Um, a, a Terry knows I've built into to place within the law firm a customer feedback loop where we get that feedback from every single customer after 
every transaction they have that's attached to each team member and we review that in terms of their training and so on. So how is that received? We contact the customers when they provide that feedback as well. You know, retail does it exceptionally well, that feedback mm -hmm. loop side of things service sector we've got a little bit to learn from some of our friends out there uh, but it it's consciously thinking about that how do you measure that what do you put in place but culturally if you're not driving it and if it's not in the goals and kpis of your team members then it, it is really challenging thank you i'd like to pose the same question to you Kay, especially with boq and the slogan of being a bank that one could love how do you measure that soft side of the corporate's performance so we've actually just recently changed our um, group strategy and our um, purpose is now building social capital through banking. Mm. One of the things that I struggle with in listening to what Michelle was saying was how do you actually measure benevolence? Mm. The reason that we do it is to build trust, retain our customers, and ultimately, you know, improve our profitability. Um, but in, yeah, the piece I really struggle with, and like every other organisation, we measure NPS and we measure customer satisfaction as well. Um, but the burning question for me is, how do you actually measure trust? Mm. And are we receiving a return on doing the right thing? Mm. It, because we all know that we should do the right thing. And I think it's a social, cultural shift. Um, but how do you understand, is it actually making an impact? That's right, that's an unaddressed gap, I would say, yet, that we need to resolve. Yes, I think there's some opportunity for some research yes. there. Yes, yes. indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you wanted to say well, something? Well, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think one of the questions is, well, who, who are we being benevolent to? And I think our paradigm around that has shifted. Like when I entered the workforce in the early 90s, it was about being benevolent to shareholders. Let's do what we can um, and be well intended to shareholders. But, you know, in terms of building social capital as a purpose, well, that's a very um, different, um, I guess, filter for your benevolence. And, um, and so I, I think that's that's important and and I guess it goes back to what I was saying before, is it like do nothing or do what pays, um, you know, or do what's fair and do what's right. And uh, if we become, the more transparency um, we can demonstrate as organisations around benevolent practices, well then they will become the norm and the cost will be losing licence to operate if, um, if you're not behaving in these ways. In terms of, um, so my, my organisation works in um, purpose-led transformation, helping for-profit companies transition to uh, making profit purposefully and becoming purpose-led organisations. And one of the organisations we're working with at the moment is a coal mine um, that's Enclosure. Okay, so we've been working with them for over a year. And, um, and so the purpose that we co-designed with them was um, to deliver responsibly and transition well together. And so uh, the key word there really was together, which put front and centre like the multi -stake, multiple stakeholders that are um, impacted by a coal mine um, existing and closing. And so that includes the employees, it includes the suppliers, it includes the environment, it includes the community, it includes mm. the shareholders, and, and so on and so on. So I think, um, you know, what we're, what, you know, what I'm really passionate about is creating that systems change that um, benevolence becomes um, BAU. And it's certainly um, uh, an enabler um, of, um, of trust um, and trust is an enabler of being able to deliver on our purpose and um, an enabler of sustainable business and truly sustainable businesses is, is um, you know, one businesses that can create durable returns because they are creating fair value for all the stakeholders that are part of that business's ecosystem. Brilliant uh, uh, response there about the multi-stakeholder multi perspectives that we have to think about. Thank you for that. 
I have many more questions to ask the panel, but I thought it would be a good moment now to open some, the, the floor for some questions from the audience. Any questions from the audience? Yes, there's one over there. Thank you all for the panel, it's been brilliant. I'm, I'm wondering uh, about the fact that um, benevolence can come in so many ways. So I, I was a corporate lawyer for a very long time and do private uh, do pro bono work, um, and, and that was a good thing that we would do. But I've been, I've been thinking uh, now and listening to you about uh, uh, guns, tobacco, alcohol, uh, types of businesses that however you might want to measure it, might themselves as their purpose not be benevolent, but they come up with extraordinary altruistic um, investments in benevolent uh, work. Uh, it, it seems to me that the whole analysis of benevolence is, is, is very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. are, are, you, are you talking about an individual within the group who's been permitted to do some research or some pro bono work? Is, are you gonna donate money? Is that a good thing? It might be a an Altria, but, but you're actually donating a billion dollars a year to, to good causes. Um, how do you measure the purpose of benevolence? You know, is, it, is it to greenwash the organization, and is that therefore illegitimate benevolence? Um, just, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Thank you. Anybody would like to ask? I might just quickly say that we probably separate uh, corporate social responsibility and what we do on that side with our business and the benevolent acts that we do. Mm. I think there's a, there's a, there's a difference. Um, Absolutely. I, I think one of the challenges with benevolence, it's actually, I think benevolence is a, for us, it's a customer retention, uh, retention, customer retention strategy. It's hard to use it as a customer attraction strategy mm. because it's very hard to advertise that you're a benevolent company. Mm -hmm. We could say it, but uh, you, actually people need to be able, probably experienced to know that that's what happened. Um, you mentioned UE before. I think one of the few companies that actually um, can, they, they show their benevolence probably better than, the, than others. Um, the, what they did during, again, going back to the pandemic, the, the rebate on insurance premiums. Um, so rather than reduce people's premiums, they gave them a rebate, uh, which I thought was a really clever way because it kept people paying the same amount of money, but they got some back. Um, so that was benevolent, uh, I thought, in that sense. Yes. Once you make a... Uh, a policy, it's no, lo no longer benevolence. Mm. You, 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 you d it becomes a d the default then. So, so you believe that uh, a publicly known act of benevolence takes the concept of benevolence away from the customer? Yes, it could. Mm. I think that's the risk. That's an interesting way to look at it, yes. And I tend to think that when you, you go outwardly in that respect, it can look manipulative from an organization's perspective. So this is not something where you look at it and go, oh, benevolence, we have to get on this and let's just get out there. The authenticity behind the benevolence is so important. Otherwise, you know, I think that there becomes skepticism, like we're going to uh, burn all the fossil fuels in the world and then buy some carbon offsets and hey, look, we're awesome. Uh, and it all cancels each other out. So I think that there's a lot more complexity mm. in that respect. Uh, I do agree that it's very much about that client facing when the chips are down, where you see that opportunity uh, to to step in, whether that is, um, you know, our chief executive officer, his um, his wife's dog died over the weekend and our team, we're a very small, tight team. Uh, we, we know her, we know them, we know how much of an impact that had. And so we just went out and popped, bought a little lily and, and sent it off to her. And it, it's those little things. We don't expect, you don't expect anything in return from that. There's no reason nobody said that we should do it or anything, but it's when you identify those opportunities, acting on it, not just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, that's not something that you go and put out in a newsletter or write a TV commercial about it or anything like that. But when you're talking about that customer relationship, they're the things that count, whether it's banking or, or commercial services. So I hope that helps. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Could I just add something oh, yes, there? I, I just think when ideas like this become popularized, there's always a risk that there'll be uh, people and organisations that jump on the bandwagon and want to use them as a tactic rather than a guiding principle. 
and you know, I think, um, I, you know, certainly I'm very biased, um, at, you know, with my views, but I feel that we are collectively seeing a shift in our uh, expectations and understanding around what the purpose of business is. Mm -hmm. Is the purpose of business to make as much profit as possible however we can and then once we've made profit look around and see what good we can do, especially good that we will get the most um, airtime for? No, not in my opinion. Like, And so the paradigm that you know I'm you know trying to participate in and certainly very much exposed to is one where the purpose of business is to look at what are the social and environmental challenges and opportunities of our time and how can we create businesses that address those challenges and opportunities and make enough money that we can you know create um, value for all the all the people and and f and future generations as well um, in durable ways so you know i think part of the a part of um, benevolence as a principle is are we being kind to future generations um, as well? And so, yeah, I'm quite passionate about some of those examples that you shared. Um, the way the tobacco industry has reinvented itself with vapes when we saw we were seeing such a great decline in the use of tobacco breaks my heart. Um, anyway, rant over. Thank you. It's good, good insights. I open the floor once again for any questions from the audience. Oh, yes, there's one question there. I have no idea if this is correct, but I think it's 60 to 70% of consumers are more willing to pay for ethical or sustainable brands, you know, people that are really doing things ethically. Yet, uh, we really want to make sure that we prevent greenwashing and people just saying they're ethical or they're just doing things or there's no slavery in their supply chains, etc., etc. So what are your comments or thoughts on how do we make sure that we're building trust because it really is happening, not just because people are saying, oh, well, if we say we're ethical, more people are going to, you know, be loyal to us. Mm. I think that this comes back to what all of us have touched on here. Uh, it comes back to the cultural values of the organisation. So, you know, often the, the somebody will come to a board meeting and go, oh, we need to do this. And you really need to have a good group of people who are willing to critically analyse and, and look at these ideas and go, well, is that in line with our core values? If it's not, then should it be? And if, it, if that's the case, if we're all nodding and saying, yes, what are we going to do in order to get ourselves there? But this comes back again to you have to walk your talk. Just because you say we're benevolent, uh, we have a good... Uh, sustainability approach uh, you can't just say it, you have to live it because otherwise you, you get back to that manipulation and the consumer is very smart and if you try to do it they will they'll, they'll pull on the strings and it, it won't take long for that to fall apart so I would say have some faith in the intelligence of the collective uh, in that respect and thank you very much for that. Do you want to say something as well? Well, I think transparency of information is really important. And so self-disclosure um, and various um, standards um, and the rigour of those standards around the world, like the various certifications that businesses can get. Um, and I think uh, the empowered consumer uh, to be able to communicate very quickly if something dodgy has happened mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a good a regulator, but I think yeah, transparency of information is key to all of that. Thank you very much. And in the interest of time, I would like to uh, close the panel, but there's lots of burning questions that this conversation has raised. How do we measure? How do we manage the, the potentially uh, conflicting uh, views of different stakeholders that we need to service? Lots of different facets. How do we um, scale up? How do we integrate benevolence into policies and so on and so forth? So I look forward to carrying on these conversations beyond this panel and I invite all of you to do that as well. But for now, let's please thank our panelists for their wonderful insights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trust Benevolence panel. And in the interest of time, we are running slightly